What's up, you freaking hillbilly millionaire homesteaders out there? We are in New York, and we are with the one, the only, the 18-year-old gal's wet dream, Mark Shepard. Owner of Restoration Agriculture. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a long day. We'll stop at a lot of a lot of cool places, and you'll see some pretty neat things. Be ready to uh, open your mind and, and uh, be available to new experiences. And instead of coming up with mental concepts to describe things, just let it be and check it out. If you haven't checked out his book, or you don't know anything about Mark Shepard, this guy's a huge deal. Go out, learn about things, educate yourself. If you're interested in permaculture or homesteading, this could be very applicable to you. And so today we're going to be showing you not a food forest. If you call it a food forest, you'll be corrected. <laughs> the development of an ecosystem that self-sustains and promotes itself. If you guys have not checked out Mark's book, he teaches you how we can feed the world and reduce and reverse climate change where it's not just sustainable, but regenerative. Uh, we're gonna take you around today. Here we are at one of multiple sites. Hayberry Farm. Hayberry Farms. And here is the base area. With, and this is just several blueberry farms here. Up at the road, which you can't see, right about there, whoop, right about there, is a lavender farm. Lavender farm is pick your own lavender and there's cars piled up everywhere. Those are lines way over there on that hillside. They go all the way up. Those are the swales that were created and they've interplanted different tree crop species. As the water trickles down, it hits a swale and moves that way. This, this is what's amazing. This is what, I'm not saying that we're gonna grow this way, but I'm saying here is the natural example of zero care system. We've got so strawberries, fresh salad greens, raspberries. There were grapes, uh, there's cherries and maple for sugar. And all food, 100% food. All right, guys, we are currently here standing inside the hill that we were just at earlier. Previously, we were down there. As we're around, we see these and they're in a zigzag pattern. And Mark got all excited about this chestnut tree here. So this is only three years old. It's already, and it's a hybrid, and it's already getting set to uh, flower. It'll have nuts this year. I don't know how many. Right there. Yeah, so at first it sends out catkins that don't have the female parts, just the male part, but then eventually you'll start to see a swollen part that that'll become the spiny bird where the chestnuts are. So you have a three year old one, it's popping out. Is this one three years old too? But yes. it's way down here. Yep, that's probably Chinese. Probably hybrids will come out first, but then they will get chestnut blight. Eventually, yeah. The ones in the tubes at the bottom are slower growing than Chinese. Those Chinese ones come up later and start fruiting, but the hybrids are still producing. This right here, we're standing on top of a swale. When it rains, this flat area collects all the water and it tries to wash downhill, but it can't. It hits this berm, which is in front of the chestnut trees, and the water starts to flow that way. When it gets over there, it makes a U-turn zigzags, and then it flows on a berm, just like what I'm standing on, on a swale, down the other way. Everything here is trying to become that beautiful forest land over there. A hundred years from now, Mark's dead, I'm dead. You guys are watching this video, you might be dead. This is going to look like that, only be food. Almost in a closed park where there's beautiful trees. Each one of these trees will be about that tall over there and they're almost connecting and all of this is nice, beautiful grassland. Mark, what was the time it took to build all of this? What do you mean? To go, to do this, you, so day one, I'm Joe Blow watching this video. I'm gonna buy a piece of crap farmland. Right. Step two, how long does it take to get to here and down there where they're actually already producing in Right, it's a good question, and it depends on your crop mix and what you choose to do first. As far as designing the whole agroforestry system, the overall farm plan, we start with a site analysis. So, you know, Rad sends in one of our consultants. We go over and see what the natural plant community types are, what the potentials are, what the landowner actually wants to accomplish. We figure out a plan that will strategize how to get there. That's step one. And step two is we come in and we design the system directly instead of drawing a picture and adding an expensive step in the middle, we design it from the actual movement of water on the landscape and where you want it to go. And so then it probably took me three or four days of survey work in front of the bulldozer that was excavating behind me. And so then the bulldozer came in and, and he spent probably close to a month here. I forget how many ponds are here. I think like 14 or so, 15 ponds. It takes a lot of time staying in the same spot, going back and forth, back and forth until that pond is dug. So the ponds are the big time burner on this. So it's probably the better part of a month to get the majority of this set up. And phase three was to come in the following year after everything had been you know, reseeded with grasses. Planting the trees, I don't think took longer than two or three days here. Nice 
to have somebody take care of the place for you. So what you're saying is there's a house behind us. We're not going to show too much of it, but there's a house behind you. You bought a piece of land and it's got all this farmland. And you have no interest in being a farmer. Right. You come in, you do this to it, and then you set whoever lives in that house up to rent. Six different enterprises. They're their own private independent businesses. So they come in. this guy in the house. And Correct. Who's maintaining all that? Is the farmers good? maintain it. So it's and, not and the guy in the house. Nope. Guy in the house goes to their W-2 job, like you were saying. Well, yeah. I think I'm, I'm dumb. I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, so we've got the Hayberry Farm right here. Give them a look if you're in the New York area. But right here is a actual highway. And right by the highway is a very interesting monetization system that one of the renters came up with that rents the farmland. In the summer, they have nothing but hundreds of cars lining and parking all the time. And they're coming right here and they're picking their own stuff, you know, five bucks, get a credit card machine or whatever. Then later they have their blueberry patch, really interesting stuff they're doing to monetize every aspect of things. People wanna talk about money, is about everything comes back to money, right? It's about, doesn't have to be a lot, but the reason why a lot of the stuff doesn't take off is because no one can figure out how to reliably make a living from things. All the little businesses that are renting a small portion of this farm did not have to spend 200, 300, a million dollars to buy the land first and have no money to do the thing. Here, they spent money, they bought one, two, three little sheds and they got to invest their money into that. They pay a little bit of rent, they make their income, whoever owns the land is getting the income. So we can replicate a bunch of these all over the place where you have your little hobbyist farmers. There might be a beekeeper, right? Oh, you can't keep bees in your neighborhood? Cool. These need crop pollination services anyways. Pay a little bit of rent, put the bees here. Now you turn around, you have all your honey selection. This is a blueberry patch. You can have specialty blueberry honey. The guy who does the blueberries does not want to fuss with bees. They want to fuss with blueberries. That's what they're interested about. And again, they're going to spend their money on blueberry trees. They didn't have to spend their money buying the land and then standing all the infrastructure up. So it's an interesting web of the way communities used to be where everybody helped each other and cooperated. That's what you mimic, but you do it in a modern day with a business sense and it actually matters instead of a permaculture mindset where it's uh, self-sustaining, it's just me, I gotta make it all on my own. That's not gonna work as well as tons of these. Everyone is a small economic engine that's helping assist someone who wants to do that as a small farmer. Now all of a sudden you have all of of this that's being regenerated with little to no inputs that cost very little for both parties to do, both the landlord and the tenants, and the tenants are harvesting and selling the crops and making an income from it. If they want to move, they could sell it and start over somewhere else, and a new farmer could come in and buy out their old farm. All right, guys, so everything you're looking at right now, we've got a field, and this field and grassland continues on into the forest. Basically, you buy land, and this is actually land that's in good shape. From this to that over there, a productive farm, was effectively three years work of waiting. Not three years of work. The work, remember, was three weeks and then four or five days. So it wasn't that much work. They bought degraded land where all of the topsoil had washed all the way down. And again, you can do this most anywhere. If you had a treed section, you'd go backwards. You go in with, what'd you call it? Yeah, a silver pasture by removal. Silver pasture by removal instead of silver pasture by addition. Addition. Yeah. Huge thing that Mark and his team are doing up here. Check out more on restorationagriculture.com, right? Restorationag.com. Restorationag.com. So here is a fifth season one, and we have a pond up here. It's collecting all the water down. It's at the top of the system, and then it charges the system, and then the overflow starts zigzagging around. It's actually raining right now, which is great. We might be able to see some of the swales in action. Actually, this, this swale is in action all the time because of the pond up here, which is cool. So this is five years. There is a owner operator who lives there. He bought the land. This was just abandoned fields. And the guy is now, he just mows the alleys three times a year. That's the only thing he does. He doesn't weed anything. He doesn't spray anything. He doesn't worry about anything. He has a beer in the shade or whatever, enjoying himself. But the network actually does the farming. This is a seed production location. So they harvest the seeds. Some of these have markings. And if there's a marking, certain markings mean different things and they can be selected for certain regions or to, for the breeding diversity, but this is incredible. You have the water coming out, it overflows, it starts to come here. Here's a spill point, it spills over, and it's doing the same thing, zigzagging down at a very gradual slope all the way down that way. Again, everyone knows this part, but the part they don't know is the people who live here enjoy it. They don't do very much in the middle of this three, three times a year. That's it. Boom, bam, ba -da -ba -bum, bam, ba -da -ba -bum, bam, ba -da -ba -bum, bam.